Amen. Well, do me a favor, find a Bible and get with me in Numbers chapter 9. We're doing a series through the book of Numbers. We're not going to do every chapter and every uh, verse in each chapter. We're going to kind of pull out some of the bigger uh, themes and sections there and, and just track with uh, what, what God is teaching his people because um, what, what we find out both from their literal experience and from the spiritual realities talked about later in the Bible, the people of God go through seasons in the wilderness. And so there are lessons that we need to learn from their experience in the wilderness. And so that's what we're up to. So uh, last week we were introduced to the topic and we looked at a holy God and his people. And this week we're picking up in chapter 9, and this is right before they set out. So chapters 1 through 8, there is a, a count, a census, a numbering of all the people who are a part of it, and there's a lot of preparation. In fact, there's a lot of emphasis given to one particular tribe, the Levitical tribe, the, the tribe of Levites, and their work of uh, managing the tabernacle and how all of that will unfold as they travel around. And then we get to chapter 9 in the book of Numbers, and they're about to set out. They just need two more very important reminders before they get marching. So let's pray, and we'll get to work. Lord, we ask right now that by your Spirit, through your Word, that you would speak. We're praying, Lord, as your people, that you would help us to know how to navigate life, especially those seasons that feel like a wilderness, that feel uninhabitable that feel impossible, that are challenging and stressful and demanding, would you help us, Lord, to be your people, to be faithful to you, to honor you, to trust you, to walk by faith in what you're doing among us. So we commit this time to you. We ask that it would be pleasing to you and helpful to us. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, the two things that are given here in Numbers chapter 9, the two reminders that they need before they set out are these. There is a, they need to be reminded of the Passover and the presence. The Passover and the presence. These things are items that will help them to understand their identity. As the people of God, these are key features of who we are. And when you march out into the wilderness, you're going to have to be reminded of these things over and over again. Both that God has redeemed us and that God is with us. So let's take them one at a time. The Passover comes to us on the front half of chapter 9. We see it in verses 1 and 2. The Lord spoke to Moses in the desert of Sinai in the first month of the second year after they came out of Egypt. He said, have the Israelites celebrate the Passover at the appointed time. He's giving them an event to put into their calendars. He's saying there is something of such significance that every year on this date, at this time, you need to remember this reality. You need to celebrate this event. So we have things like this in our church calendar. We've got, we've got things like Christmas. And we, you know, every year we march toward that date and we are mindful of the fact that God came to live among us. We call him Emmanuel, God with us. He's the Prince of Peace. He's the King of Kings. He's the one on whom uh, governments will rest on his shoulders. He, he is the one born of a virgin. We have this date on the calendar, so no matter how wacky the year has been and how uh, careless we may have been, on the calendar there's a date that goes, oh yeah, remember this. God sent his son. We've got other dates like this, like Good Friday and Easter. We've got dates on the calendar that we remember the Lord came and he was willing to lay down his perfect life for us. That's Good Friday. And every year we are mindful of that. And Easter, we were, we were reminded of the fact that he, he rose from the dead. He came back from the grave. He's a resurrected king. And these dates are significant because we're spiritually forgetful. We have spiritual amnesia. We go through life and we forget, like, oh yeah, I, I'm not living in the truth of that reality right now. I need something that will bring me back to it. And so we've got these important dates, and God gives them this date. When you are here in the desert, when you are arriving at this first, first month, you need to celebrate the Passover at the appointed time. God is helping them to remember their redemption. If you think about 
Passover, what is that in reference to? We have to think back to the previous account where God rescued them from Egypt. The Israelites were an incredible people that God had made some pretty audacious, uh, audacious uh, promises to of all these things that he was going to do. And then they find themselves in captivity, in Egypt, in bondage, oppressed and harassed and in this difficult circumstance, and God brings them a deliverer in Moses. And Moses begins to speak, saying, this is what God says, let my people go that they might worship me. And the king at that time, Pharaoh, hardens his heart and he says, that's never going to happen. Why would, I, why would I let the significant workforce go and just leave? Why would I do that? And so Pharaoh hardened his heart and Moses declared that there would be these plagues. And over and over again, there are these expressions of God's judgment on the people of Egypt. And the final one was the most terrifying one. It was the, the plague of the angel of death. And every firstborn child and every household would die. And there was a warning for that, and there was a provision. In fact, God told Moses, let the people know this. The angel of death is coming through the camp tonight, and here's what you need to do to be safe. Here's what you need to do. You take a lamb, every household, take a lamb and sacrifice that lamb, and then take the blood of that lamb and put it on your doorpost. And when the angel of death passes through, every house that is covered in blood will be safe but every house that is not will experience that judgment. So the blood of the lamb on the doorposts is that reminder, and that's exactly how it played out. And therefore, the people were set free, and they come out of bondage in Egypt and bondage and slavery, and they, they're set free. And now God is saying over and over again, you need to remember that event. You need to be mindful of that reality that you were spared, that you were saved, that you were redeemed, and it was on account of the blood of the lamb. Now, those little lambs that they would sacrifice, they pointed to something much greater. In fact, Christians, we understand that that was just a foreshadowing of what God was ultimately going to do in the sending of his son. And that's why the apostle Peter puts it like this to a Christian audience in 1 Peter chapter 1. He says, you know, Christians, you know that it was not with perishable things such as silver or gold that you were redeemed. You were redeemed, but it, but it wasn't with some, you know, monetary value. It was, re- it was a redemption, he goes on to say, with the precious blood of Christ, a lamb without blemish or defect. The redemption that we have is on account of the blood of the lamb. That's who we are. We remember these realities because we need to understand how is it that we came to be the people of God? Well, we came to be the people of God because God made a provision for us, and it is trusting in the blood of the lamb. And so we as a church family, we take communion week by week. We remind ourselves of the broken body of Jesus Christ as we eat of the bread. We remind ourselves of the blood that covers us and gives us forgiveness of sins. We take of the cup and we drink and we do that week by week because we're forgetful. I'm a pastor and I forget the significance of what God has done in that redeeming work. And and we want to live in light of that. So over and over again, we do these different things. We, we remind ourselves of our identity. Here's who we are. Here's how we came to be who we are. And so we need to live in light of that. Well, as the Passover is described here, a couple different themes emerge that are very significant. They are complementary themes. On the one hand, what we find when we think about the, the Passover is that there is this rigidity to it that there is a specific way in which it needs to be observed, and it is not to be trifled with. We don't get to freestyle on this one. God says, here is how this is to play out. Let me give you exact details. There's a rigidity to it. But then on the other hand, there's also a flexibility to it, that God is willing to accommodate to the needs of his people. And here's here's what it's getting at, and I'll show them both to you in just a moment. But here's what it's getting at, this harmony between the law of God and his grace. There's a harmony between the law of God and the requirements and the rigidity and also the accessibility, the grace of God that says, but I want people to come to me. I want people to experience me. I want people to have that saving experience with me. And these things are held together. So let's look at them one at a time. The rigidity comes over and over again in this chapter as the requirements are explained. Verse three, celebrate it at the appointed time at twilight on the 14th day of this month. 
in accordance with all its rules and regulations. Passover has all kinds of different stipulations. It has to be on a certain day. It has to be at a certain time. During a certain month, it has to have all these things that happen. There are rules and regulations, and, and those have to be obeyed. They have to be obeyed exactly. Here's why. We are dealing with a holy God. The law, the regulations, the stipulations, they all point to God's perfect holiness. You have to understand, as you work your way through the book of Numbers, you're dealing with a holy God. And he's trying to explain that to them and reiterate that over and over again. We're dealing with a holy God. Verse 12, when they celebrate the Passover, they must follow all the regulations. There's a, there's a rigidity here. Everything has to be carefully observed because we are dealing with a holy God. Verse 13 tells us that if anyone fails to celebrate, if anyone fails to celebrate the Passover, they must be cut off from their people for not presenting the Lord's offering at the appointed time. They, they will bear the consequences of their sin. All of this is pointing at the rigidity of the law. There's a holy God that we're dealing with and he is communicating to us in a way that arouses our awareness. God is different. We don't just go around making our own rules. He has given us his word, and it is specific, and it is rigid, and it is, in some instances, terrifying. How on earth are we going to follow that kind of God? Well, the second thing we find here is this accessibility. So yes, it's rigid, but at the same time, he accommodates he wants people to come to him, and so he makes provisions for them. So one of, the, one of the rules in their culture was that if they were unclean, they could not participate in these religious observances. There's this category of un, unclean, and, and there was a group of people that technically in this moment were unclean. They, they had, the law says that if you come into contact with a dead body, you would be ceremonially unclean and you would have to wait a certain amount of time before you could bathe and be reintroduced into the community. Well, there was a group that had that problem. So God is saying, celebrate this Passover and anyone who fails to do that will be cut off. And they say, Moses, we got a problem here. We're not fit to celebrate right now. We're unclean. What do we do? Do we just, you know, RSVP, sorry, can't make it. We're unclean. What do we do here? What does God want from us? And, and Moses says, that's a good question. Let me check. And he prays about it, and he returns this answer. Verses 10 and 11. They are still to celebrate the Lord's Passover, but they are to do it on the 14th day of the second month at twilight. So here's what God is saying. Though the law is specific and rigid, he wants people to come to him. He makes an exception here. He makes a provision here, and that reveals his heart. It's the heart of mercy and grace, that he wants people to have the opportunity to come to him, and so he makes arrangements for that. There's another indication of that in verse 14. There's a surprise feature. It's saying, not only is this for you guys, but it's also for the alien. It's for the foreigner. It's for those who are residing among you. Not only is this something that I, that I want all my people to experience, God has an eye for the nations. Look at verse 14. A foreigner residing among you is also to celebrate the Lord's Passover in accordance with its rules and regulations. You must have the, sa you must have the same regulations for both the foreigner and the native born. But here's what, here's what that's getting at. God is making a way for people to come to him. There's a grace in this. Yes, he has a law and it is demanding, but he is also accommodating and merciful. He wants people to come to him and so here's what we find then when we celebrate the Passover, when we celebrate the redeeming work of God, these things are in harmony with each other. The holiness of God and his grace are true, both true of God. And we need them both. And that's what makes the good news so good, so great. This is the kind of God that we're dealing with. On the one hand, he's holy, but on the other hand, he's accepting. On the one hand, he's holy, and none of us in here would have the, the, the wherewithal in us to be able to say we could perfectly obey his commands and regulations, and we could earn our way into his favor. He's holy, but at the same time, he's accepting. So this reminds us of both the law and the grace of the gospel, that we're dealing with a holy God who makes a way for us to come to him, and it is through the blood of the Lamb. It is through our faith in what Jesus Christ has done, his perfect obedience, 
his perfect righteousness. And really, the only place where this is resolved is Calvary. The cross of Jesus Christ is the place where we see both the holiness of God and his mercy and grace on perfect display. This is where the holiness of God is satisfied and the grace of God is extended at the cross of Jesus Christ. That is the good news of the gospel. Now, here's what that does. When we keep reminding ourselves of our identity, we are the redeemed people through the blood of Jesus Christ. It actually should show up in the way that we live. So we also should be people who have this complementary reality that we believe in a holy God and a gracious God, and it actually shows up in how we behave and how we live. And there are errors here to be avoided. In fact, um, I was talking this week with Tyler, and we, we were just discussing this, that there are these different, these different ways that we can get off track. And most of us, I would say all of us in here, gravitate in one direction or the other, and it can change season by season. But there are moments in our lives where sometimes we gravitate to the holiness of God, and we start reading the Bible, and we, we underline commands and stipulations, and we, under, we, we underline the things that God is asking us to do, and we get very passionate about God's holiness and very serious about that, and we begin to pursue that. And we can overemphasize it to the neglect of God's grace, and we can begin becoming rigid people who are no fun to be around, and we're, we actually look at other people who aren't trying as hard as we are, and, and we despise them. We look at them and we go, they're not doing what God demands in his word. They're not righteous like he wants. And we become mean-spirited, self-righteous people. We can gravitate in that direction if we lose the grace of God. Or we can go in the complete opposite direction and we can presume upon the grace of God and we can go, look, he accepts us. Look at how accepting and loving he is. He clearly doesn't really care if we mess up. And we can begin to be dismissive of his holiness and his requirements. And we can begin to kind of put that aside and go, no, 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 God is all about grace. He just loves us. He just loves us as is. We don't have to change anything. Yes, I failed, but that's the kind of person that God loves. Here's what the good news of the gospel is. It's both. They're in harmony. God is both holy and gracious and when Christians believe that, it means we, we start to deal with people differently. We do take God's word seriously. We do consider his holiness. We think about that all the time, but we also understand his grace and his mercy. We begin to love people like God loves us, and that's a beautiful thing. So in the wilderness, we need that reminder. Here's who we are. We are the redeemed people. A holy God has made a way for us to be in personal relationship with him through the blood. The second thing he gives us here is his presence. He gives us himself. In fact, Moses was wrestling with God, and this is from Exodus chapter 33. This is prior to these events. He said to God, look, if you don't come with us, don't even send us. If you're not willing to be present among your people, we don't even want to go. And so here God says, essentially, I'm going to make good on that promise. I will be among you. I will live with you. So verses 15 and 16 of Numbers 9, he says this, on, on the day the tabernacle, the tent of the covenant law was set up, the cloud covered it. From evening till morning, the cloud above the tabernacle looked like fire. That's how it continued to be. The cloud covered it, and at night it looked like fire. Here's what's going on. God is there. He gives a display of his manifest presence. They've got a tabernacle, a meeting place between God and humanity. And on that meeting place, above that meeting place, however this shapes up in your brain, there's this pillar of cloud reaching up to the heavens. There's this visible thing there over the top of this tent of meeting, this visible thing going up into the air. And then at nighttime, it is illuminated. It's fire. So it's cloud by day, it's smoke by day, it's fire by night, and it's there. And it's an indication that God is with his people in the wilderness. He has committed himself to being with them. He gives them a visible sign of his presence. It's a, it's a reminder that even though they'll fail repeatedly, he is still there. God is still present with his people. Now that promise doesn't go away. Obviously, we don't have a cloud over the building today. We don't have fire at night leading our way, but God has promised us his presence. 
In fact, the Lord himself was called, was named Emmanuel, God with us. The gift of the Holy Spirit is the gift of God coming to reside among us. Jesus himself told us in the great commissioning of his disciples that he will be with us to the very ends of the age. In fact, we'll put it up on the screen. Jesus said, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you. And surely, here it is, I am with you always to the very end of the age. God makes this promise that he is going to be with us. And that's what we most need in the wilderness, God's presence among us. Now that presence becomes our leadership. The Holy Spirit, the Spirit of God, the presence of God with us becomes the leader of the camp. In fact, wherever he goes, we go. When he goes, we go. Watch this in verses 17 to 19. Whenever the cloud lifted from above the tent, the Israelites set out. Wherever the cloud settled, the Israelites encamped. At the Lord's command, the Israelites set out, and at his command, they encamped. Okay, so they are following the presence. So if they show up somewhere, and they're setting up camp, and, and you know, they do that, well, if the cloud lifts, they say, we're going wherever the cloud's going. We're, we're going with the presence. If God is setting out, we're setting out. Pack up camp. Here we go. The presence of the Lord becomes the leader of the camp. Not only does the Lord lead the way, he also gives us the time stamps. Verse 22, whether the cloud stayed over the tabernacle for two days or for a month or a year, the Israelites would remain in camp and not set out. But when it lifted, they would set out. We're on God's timeline now. We're going to be here as long as he wants us here. Then we're going to set out whenever he sets out. We're going to follow his leadership because his presence is the thing that we need in the desert wilderness. We need to know that the Lord is among us and we're following him wherever he is leading us. That's the other reminder that's given here. We need the presence of the Lord as we go through the wilderness season. So here's a question that I have for us. How do we know how the Lord is leading? How do we How do we keep in step with the Spirit as he sets out? How do we keep hold of the promise of his presence? What are the things that we could do to ensure that we are in step with what he's doing? And it's not an easy thing. In fact, uh, we don't have a cloud. I wish we did. Wouldn't that be wonderful if we just kind of looked outside? Okay, God, how are we doing? All right, we're good. Or he, you know, starts to move away and we go, okay, guys, get ready. Buckle up, we're going now, we're following him. I don't know where we're going to land, but we're following him. I mean, wouldn't it be wonderful if that were the case today? It's not that easy, and in fact, anyone who presumes to think it's that easy, I I think is uh, a little bit misled. Uh, I'm going to mess you up here for just a minute, and I hope it ends up being a good and gracious thing, but um, you might think, here's all we need to do, Cor, let's just read the Bible, right? If you just read the Bible, you'll know what the Spirit is doing. You'll, you'll know what God wants from you. The only problem I have with that is there are people far better than me in history who've devoted themselves much more diligently than I have to reading the scriptures that got it wrong. Think about the Pharisees. That was their vocation. Bible reading was their job. Trying to properly interpret the scriptures was their job. But what happened when the Lord showed up? There was an, a, a reality check. You missed it. You know your Bible, you don't know what God is up to. So we can't just say, hey, church family, all we're going to do is just read the scriptures and we'll know exactly what God wants to do. No, well, that's a good idea, but that's not a guarantee. Or you might say, well, let's just listen to the leading of the Holy Spirit. Well, actually, in you know, what I was talking about at the front end of the service, there were a couple of verses in there that I, that I omitted, but it says that the prophets had dreams that the people encouraged them to have, but they weren't accurate dreams. There's spiritual leadership that actually misses the mark of what God is trying to do. People who are saying, I'm hearing the voice of God, and this is what I'm discerning God is saying, and they're misled. So, church family, that, that should give us pause, right? Like, okay, if you can read the Bible and get it wrong, and you can have spiritual leaders who get it wrong, what shot do we have of hearing the voice of God and following his lead. Well, 
I would say we have a pretty good shot at it because here's what God is like. He wants us to know. He wants us to know. And if we're humble enough to say, I have it within me to get it wrong, you have it within you to get it wrong, so we're going to humbly pursue God in this moment, and we're going to trust that by His Spirit He's going to lead us, then I think we're in good shape. I think He will reveal His will to us in His Word. I think He will lead us by His Spirit. As we consider the uh, moment that we're in in the life of our church, and we've been wrestling with God over this idea of buying a building, that process has been something that, honestly, I've, in, I've enjoyed because every day I wake up and I say, God, I'm not confident in how this is going to shake out. I, I don't presume to say, thus saith the Lord, here's what we're doing, everyone, let's march after it. No, every day I wake up and I go, God, what are you doing today? What are you up to? Because I just want to make sure I'm with you. If the cloud is setting out, I'm going to go with you. If it's staying put, I'm going to go with you. But I just want you. And I think our leadership team and the way that this is all unfolded, all of us have been saying the same thing. We are trusting day by day in, in God's leadership. And so we can be confident then that wherever we arrive, we're arriving there in God's will because he's there. And so that's the way that this has worked for me, and I hope it has for you as well. But these two reminders are significant for us, both as a community of faith and as individuals. We go through seasons in the wilderness, and what we need are these two things. One, a reminder of who we are. God has redeemed us by the blood of the Lamb. Keep preaching that to yourself. Keep reminding yourself of that truth. You are a child of the King because you are covered by the blood of the Lamb. And the second thing is, God is with you in the wilderness. He will not abandon you or forsake you. He is with you in the wilderness. So no matter how difficult the season may be, keep looking to him, keep trusting in him, keep believing in him, and all will go well. So let me invite the band to come, and I'm going to pray right now, and we'll step into a time of communion. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for your reminders. We thank you for the provisions that you've given us. We thank you that we can remember how it how it is that we came to be your people, that by our faith in Jesus Christ and his blood shed on our behalf, we are redeemed. And Lord, you also give us yourself, your presence, your leadership, your goodness in our camp. And that's what we want. More than anything else, we just want you. So help us to discern your leadership in this moment. In Jesus' name, amen.